Thank you for that really, can you hear me, very generous introduction. Uh, only one clarification, Scheherazade is my younger sister, so she would be so happy that you thought she was my older sister. <laughs> um, and also thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, I would like to thank Ms. Helen Jane Brown for inviting me here. Um, she was very compassionate and persistent, which I think for, for, is the work you're always doing. Uh, but to bring me here today, I think, took a lot of, lot of those qualities. And I've just been honored to spend so much time with her over the last uh, 24 hours. Um, I also would like to thank uh, the Clinton School for Public Service, um, and particularly Mr. DePipia for um, organizing my presence here, and again, for also being generous and patient with me. <clears throat> And so I'm just honored to have this conversation with you about ending racism and ending rape in the United States. Um, and I would like to set the stage for my talk very briefly. Um, I understand in Arkansas that there is a legislation or an attempt to defund Planned Parenthood right now. Um, one of the results obviously would be to uh, ha women would have less access to services like breast cancer screenings and annual checkups and low-cost contraceptives, but also one of the results may be kind of lack of funding for domestic violence shelters and sexual assault centers here. And so I just want to think about the ways in which uh, defunding Planned Parenthood will have a kind of ripple effect, not only on the issues that we kind of associate with Planned Parenthood, but on these other um, issues of domestic violence and sexual assault, which we may not associate with Planned Parenthood, but that are all part of the kind of the women's movement and um, part of how we think about gender equality in the United States. And I bring up this because rape crisis centers have played a crucial role in my own recovery. As a 22-year-old dub double Ivy League graduate, I moved back to Philadelphia without health insurance, and I felt like uh, my world was falling apart because I'd been sexually assaulted. And I remember my first trip to Women Organized Against Rape in downtown Philadelphia. I went to the office, I was carrying this book called Transforming Our Rape Culture in my backpack, and when I first arrived at the five-story brick building, I looked around to see if anyone could see me. If I pushed the button for the second floor, would everyone know I was a rape victim? When I entered the small office, I was greeted by a friendly face and a warm smile. I stared at the Alice Walker poster that framed the wall, and my fear of being turned away was so great, it was so overwhelming, that I slowly said my name to stave off any possibility that I had mixed up the date or time. And yet that moment, that moment that I entered that rape crisis center, saved my life. So it is with a heavy heart that I plead with you all here in Little Rock, Arkansas, to ensure that all men and women, girls and boys, have access to services and spaces that were the victories of the feminist movements of the 1970s and 1980s. And while the rape crisis centers are maybe only, uh, it's not the only answer to this global epidemic of sexual violence, it is a good place to start. But it seems like I've gotten ahead of myself. So let me go back to the beginning of my long walk home. In August 1997, I went to the Philadelphia Sex Crimes Unit to give a statement about being raped in my first year of college. I had finally mustered enough courage and strength to publicly acknowledge that I had been raped. Although I was raped in October 1992, I had never before this moment felt comfortable pressing charges. My perpetrator had been, another, had been a friend, another African-American student at our predominantly white college campus. And I pretended that night that nothing ever happened, that I was not raped. It was only until I came face to face with the brutality of rape again when I went on a study abroad program to Kenya that I could no longer run from this trauma. I knew my case would be a long shot because I was just within that five-year statute of limitations because I knew most rape cases did not end with a verdict of guilty. Nonetheless, I wanted to assert my right to press charges. When I visited the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office later that summer, I was so incredibly afraid to tell my story to this stranger who was white and he was male that sat behind me, uh, sat before me behind his desk. And after I told my story, he told me this case was unprosecutable. He did tell me that he believed my story because it was filled with too many holes, too many inconsistencies just for me to just make up. He reasoned, however, that in 1992, the no means no rape clause did not yet exist. And in his judgment, according to the law in 1992, I was not legally raped. Like so many women and some men who sat in his office before my presence there, the finality of this decision was overwhelming. A flood of self-doubt resurfaced. 
I had tried to seek justice, but was faced with the reality of my invisibility. Because perpetrators are more likely to rape someone they know, this accounts for 80% of all rape cases, they are also more likely to use physical and emotional coercion rather than the threat of physical violence to um, assault their victims. The fact that one in three women will be sexually assaulted in her lifetime and that African American women who constitute about seven to eight percent of the U.S. population but are 28 percent of the U.S. rape population, um, that black women are less likely to report a crime of domestic violence or sexual assault, are less likely to have our cases come to trial, and less likely to have these cases result in conviction than white women only meant that I now was just another statistic. My story fell into that no man's land of believability but not criminality. Justice, it seems, was for another day. And yet on that fateful day, when I first went to the Philadelphia Sex Crimes Unit to first report my story, my younger sister, Shahrazad Tillett, accompanied me. Holding my hands as we walked the steps, I can't help but think that she felt both trepidation and concern. For it was only 13 years before that we had accompanied our mother, a young 28-year-old African-American woman, to the police station in Boston at which she told her own story of being sexually assaulted by a stranger. When I left, my sister listened as I went over the details of my difficult encounter with the policewoman. Struggling for language, she said she felt completely useless, for she had no way to help me. The silence, though lasting only for a few months, um, eventually prompted her to find her own voice and later helped me with the help of our father's camera and the spirit of sisterhood to find a solution that would change the both of us forever. And I will begin with that moment to go into this history of a long walk home. And I think it's really fitting that we're here at the um, a Center for Public Service because a long walk home really comes out of sisterhood um, and survivorship, but it also comes out of a need to kind of tra take an individual story and then take that story and then change the world. So Along Walk Home, as we said already, was founded in 2003, and our mission is to use art therapy and the visual and performing arts to end violence against girls and women. We focus specifically on communities that are most affected by these issues, such as low-income communities and communities of color. But our emphasis is not simply to provide resources for victims or potential victims of these crimes, but also to empower men and women, boys and girls from these communities to be leaders and experts in the national movement to end gender violence. And so you really won't be able to read this, but this is one of our infographics. And we sort of start with the story of the walk home and there are various programs and see ourselves as participating in the global march and global movement to end violence against girls and women. And so this is a short map. Now I'll act or add uh, Arkansas to it, of places we've been. Um, this is a little bit dated, but these are some of the places that Story of a Rape Survivor, the program that I'll briefly talk about, has been around the country. That's our national program. And so these are the four different programs we have. Story of Rape Survivor, um, the Multimedia Performance, SOARS, Public Workshops and Lectures, uh, the Girlfriends Leadership Institutes, which are primarily based in Chicago, and we just launched the Parent Leadership Institute um, in Chicago. So working with parents of the girls that we are empowering through the Girlfriends Leadership Institute to end violence in their homes, communities, and, 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 and neighborhoods and cities. And so I'll briefly talk about Story of a Rape Survivor and how that is actually what came out of that encounter um, that I had at the Philadelphia Sex Crimes Unit in the, in the district attorney's office. And it's an encounter that then my sister responded to by photographing my recovery process. So we know the stats are pretty devastating. It's the number one violent crime on college campuses. One in four college women report surviving rape. Um, between 62 and 84% of survivors know their attacker. 42% of rape victims have never told anyone. 30% of rape victims contemplate suicide after the rape. And 82% of, of rape survivors say that rape permanently changed them. Um, and this is about who are the perpetrators. And so 55%, you, you can read this, of gang rapes on college campuses are committed by fraternities. 99% of people who rape are men. Um, and uh, most rapes don't end up in any conviction. So 95% of the time, uh, if a man sexually assaults a woman or another man, he will not end up in jail. And I think the last stat is actually really telling. 35% of men report at least some degree of likelihood of raping if they could be assured that they would not be caught or punished. 
And so in 1997, I, as part of my own recovery, I published my story in a feminist newspaper on campus called Generation XX. So this is back in the 90s. Now we have different Generation Ys and Generations, you know, Zs and stuff like that. But we were Generation X, so this was Generation XX. And so I published this story. At the same time, my sister was taking a social documentary photography class in South Jersey at Rutgers University. And so she asked if she could photograph me in my healing process, which was becoming more and more public at the time. And so I said, yeah, sure. I had no idea what this meant. She was going to take her camera and start photographing all the spaces and places I would be. I was very naive. She was very naive. She began photographing me. So this is the first photograph that Shahrazad took of me, um, which last night I thought it was another photograph. So this was also interesting to know her own history, the history of sores, and which photographs I remember as being the first one and which one is actually the first one. This is another photograph that Shahrazad took of me um, in October of 1997, and it was the same night that I'd seen my perpetrator for my freshman year at a homecoming event um, at the University of Pennsylvania. And then these are just, I'm going to show you some brief photographs from Soares um, that's, that kind of shows the intimacy and the compassion that she used with her camera to help me heal. This is a photograph of a self-portrait I did in therapy. Uh, Shahrazad, um, created a, a kind of theme that she saw, or she identified a theme in my healing. And body image was one of the most significant ways that sexual assault changed my life. I had uh, suffered from um, overeating and overexercise uh, and bulimia. So Shahrazad uh, started to photograph my response to, to working, uh, working out in a good way and also overworking out in a, in a negative way. She also started photographing my activism around ending sexual violence. And so this is a photograph of me in a documentary, No, um, using a, a pamphlet or kind of a leaflet that I had gotten or a flyer that I had gotten. Um, I went to grad school at Harvard University. And so 90% of rapes at Harvard are never reported. Um, but what's interesting about this photograph is not only was I was doing activism at, at, in grad school, but also I was in this film as well. She also photographed really intimate moments, the beginning of my relationship. And so the ways in which sexual violence affects romantic relationships or sexual, uh, consensual sexual encounters is also part of SOARS. And then she turned the photograph on herself and started ph photographing how sexual assault affects what we call secondary victims of sexual assault, the people who are partners or friends or loved ones of, of sexual assault victims. And then she eventually started photographing Soares itself, the, men, the women who actually make up the cast of Soares. And this is like the kind of uh, canonical figure of, of Soares as well. So she started photographing me in 1997, uh, and she stopped in 2007. And she's recently added photographs. But the, the actual social documentary aspect of Soares was about 10 years. So I'm just going to show a brief clip, because it not only was it a phot photography project, but Shahrazad really wanted to figure out a way to bring her photographs to life. And so it's now a multimedia performance comprised of artists from all over the country. Soares documents my uh, healing process as a sexual assault survivor. Um, Sherazad started documenting me in 1998. Now we have this whole mega production as a result. Um, so even though I don't really dance or sing or actually do any of the theatrical parts of the show, um, the pictures are of me and so sort of my journey as a survivor and these wonderful women tell the story, bring the story to life and sort of remake it into their own story in some ways. So. You love Love is kind and love can give and get no gain I'm in uh, Utah, Utah, Salt Lake City and I'm really excited because they've been trying to bring us for four years 
and we finally are here. So I'm really excited about that. And I know how important this work is in terms of we have crisis centers bringing us. Um, oftentimes they don't have the funding to bring us. So um, we do a lot of works at universities um, who have funding. And I'm very honored and amazed that they were so committed to bringing us. So their energy and our excitement. Um, it's the first week of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And this is our first show for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So. Get the spirit in the dark. I'm getting the spirit in the dark. People moving. Oh. And I'm dancing to Spirit in the Dark by Aretha Franklin. And it's, I think I got lucky in terms of being new and kind of fitting into the piece, but getting to come into the piece at kind of a, it's kind of a newer section to the program. Um, it's spirituality and sexuality, and it comes at a perfect time in the piece, um, in the whole program, and it's kind of hope and uplifting, and it's a great time working with such talented women. Tonight, I'm going to be performing two poems written by none other than Salamisha Margaret Tillett. The first of which is entitled, Do You Know What Rape Feels Like? A poem that Salamisha wrote in the very early days of her healing process that, that Shahrazad actually got out of her journal. Do you know what rape feels like? Do you know what it feels like to have your howl silenced by a fist? What it feels like when you are rushed into, pressed down on, and opened by a knife? Um, I opened the show and closed the show. And so I opened the show with a, an adaption of Strange Fruit that was performed by Billie Holiday. But, um, Salamisha rewrote the lyrics to reflect her experience with the rape. And so I do that a cappella. And then at the end of the show, I sing one of the songs that I wrote, um, African Butterfly. I sing that song um, with the music, and it's a celebration. You know, everyone's healed and happy. So that's what, um, what I do at the end. So I kind of set the tone in the beginning with the sadness and, you know, the devastation of rape. And then um, there's the jubilation and the healing and the happiness at the end. So it's like a full journey throughout that whole thing and I kind of open and close that. Um, and lectures that are part of it as well. Um, but one of the things that we found with using the arts to do this is that you attract non-traditional populations um, to sexual assault prevention programs. So we have a lot of people of color, um, people who tend not to be necessarily um, as involved. They may be doing social justice activism on their campus, but they may not be doing uh, it around issues of, of sexual violence or domestic violence. So SOARS is a really good program to get people of color, particularly African-American um, men and women on college campuses to be involved in anti-rape activism. Um, we also get a fair number of, of men. Um, and I think the arts is effective because not only is it entertaining and educational, but because we use so many different multi-mediums, so many different forms of like dance and photography and, and music and poetry, that it's a really multi-sensory experience. And so if you don't identify with one particular art form, you're probably going to identify with something else. So it's a really open and accessible way of talking about sexual violence. And since we're really focused on my recovery or the recovery, I think it also gives people a model for healing um, and, and a different kind of activism. And also because the program really started when Shahrazad was in college, it also shows that student activism can really make a difference. Uh, and also we have a fair number of people who are survivors in the audience, and so we usually pass out a, 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 
uh, an evaluation at each performance to figure out who's there and if they've learned anything about resources on campus um, or, in their, or in their community and if they've learned anything new about sexual violence itself. And so going to college campuses and doing this work, we realized that there's still a gap in, in, in services um, and, and programming. And so Shahrazad became a rape crisis counselor. She had her master's in art therapy, and she moved to Chicago as a result of doing this work on SOARS. And so she was located in a community in the west side of Chicago, which is a working class African American community that have really high rates of, of violence, um, and particularly high rates of sexual violence. And yet she was the only rape crisis counselor in that area. Uh, so there was one rape crisis counselor, that was Shahrazad, uh, and she was noticing that people weren't coming to the rape crisis center. Uh, they were seeking help from churches or from uh, different like doctors, medical doctors, but they weren't coming to traditional rape crisis services or rape crisis agencies. And so she had to do a lot of outreach and collaboration. Um, and this one school in Chicago, in the west side of Chicago, called North Lawndale College uh, Prep, Charter High School reached out to her because they, were, they did a study of their students and they found that there were kind of alarming rates of sexual violence and that the students weren't disclosing it to anyone. And so Cher started, uh, Sherazad started doing uh, counseling there and then that became the birth of our new program, Girlfriends. And so this is just a snapshot of girls in that community. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's higher than the average. Uh, national rates and, and other ways they're in line with the kind of violence that we see happening a, across the country. Um, so 50% of the girls in our program have experienced sexual assault, 61% uh, are teen dating violence survivors, 70% um, have experienced sexual harassment, and a smaller percentage, this is not the population that's necessarily in, engaged uh, or being victims of sex trafficking, but you have a small, small percentage who are part of, of that as well. Um, and then a high percentage in, involved in internet sexual violence. In general, in the country, we know the numbers are pretty outstanding. A survey of high school students found that one in five had experienced forced sex, and half the girls told no one about the incident. 90% uh, of children and teens are raped by someone they, they know, and 25% of childhood sexual assault survivors told someone during their childhood. Um, but what you see is that most of the times, and I guess I'll just reiterate the fact, that half the girls told no one about the incident, but like 80% of girls tend to tell another friend, or sorry, it's 60%, and then they'll tell a mother or a parent or a teacher. So the primary resource for teenagers are each other. So if you actually want to get at this issue, um, you should provide services in their schools and the community, but also you probably want to empower the girls to be adequate resources as well. And so that's our mission. It's also one of the top reasons why teenagers drop out of high school. Um, so this is the Girlfriends Manifesto. And so it says, we are girlfriends, we are not what society makes us, we are not loud, gold diggers, or hoes, we are intelligent, we are independent, we are powerful, we are beautiful inside and out, we are creative, outspoken, and misunderstood, we stand for equality, respect, and unity for everyone, we fight violence against girls and women, we are leaders, we strive to succeed, we have a voice, we are the future. And so this was a collaborative um, manifesto created by the girls, and I'm going to show you a quick video and then I'll... I'll It is always hard to talk about rape, and in some communities, the silence is deafening. But as they heal, survivors can learn to be advocates for themselves and others as they tell their painful stories. Shahrazad Tillett, co-founder of the organization A Long Walk Home, is committed to teaching them how. And her vision is to turn survivors into leaders for the movement to end violence against girls and women. Recently, I went to Chicago to meet her and the extraordinary teens in the program. My sister is a sexual assault survivor, and in her process of me trying to help her heal, I photographed her healing process. Um, and so that really became the understanding of how to use art as a way to help someone and help someone heal. And so the heart of a long walk home is using art and it, as a tool to end sexual violence and dating violence in the communities. So it, art to end violence, I mean, that seems yeah. surprising. Yeah, um, art is a way of engaging people. Um, I think it's such a really taboo topic to talk about violence against women and girls. And so we use art as a way to entertain, to get them to talk about it, to get them to heal, to like use art as a way to transform the culture at large about things. A lot of times we don't like to talk about stuff that happens within our household. 
And I feel like now with this program, I'm able to speak out about it. And I'm able to help other people speak out about it. Like when I, I feel like when I tell my story, it helps other people tell their stories. I think I use anger the most to kind of deal with what happened to me as a child. So when I started to paint, my mom, she used to always ask me, why do you paint so, why do you paint everything so dark? And then when I got to know Miss Tillett, she kind of helped me realize like, wow, this is all the anger that I have inside of me putting it on the canvas. Hmm. Right, so, so those dark colors in that painting was about, was about you. About the pain and the fear. I was the type of person that feel like I don't need to tell nobody nothing. Everything is better left unsaid, but me doing that only ended up to horrible things and me thinking horrible things. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you talk and you speak and you know that somebody is there to listen, that it, it could work out. One, two, three. Yeah. I think we're so really protective of young girls when it comes to this issue, or we don't think of them as leaders about mm -hmm. these things. Like, how do you actually become a leader about these things? Right. We think of them as victims mm -hmm. or survivors, yeah. not as leaders. They train um, to end dating violence and sexual violence in their community, and then they go out and spread the message, or they are building their own programs. So right. that's the, the idea of the movement. A movement, a movement that can inspire a community and change the way we view survivors of sexual assault. And that's why Shahrazad Tillett is this week's foot soldier. To learn more about her organization, go to alongwalkhome.org. And that is our show for today. Thank you to our teams, Emma, Sammy, and Elena, and thank you to Karen Finney. Also, thanks to you at home for watching tomorrow on MHP. What happened to the campaign of big ideas? What makes for a great education? And does Paul Ryan have a plan to solve the national debt? Plus, iconic actress Jennifer Beals will join me. All that tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Eastern. And coming up, Weekends with Alex Witt. Two thousand nine, and now it's a year-long program um, in two sites in Chicago, and we have a summer training, uh, and then after-school programs, and now we're actually having we're a class in a, in a public school in Chicago that girls can take as an elective, and so this week is International uh, Street Harassment Week, and so we're showing how uh, they actually have their own marches in in, in their in the West Side of Chicago in, in North Lawndale. In uh, Illinois right now, there's a legislation on the books, Ensuring School Safety Act, that are protecting, that, that are, is there to protect uh, parents or expected parents and students um, who are victims of sexual assault or domestic violence, and it's to protect them in all public schools in the state of Illinois. And it recently passed through the House, and it, sorry, it passed through the Senate and is now up um, in the House. And so we partnered with the National Shriver uh, Center in Chicago, National Shriver Center for Poverty and Law. And so what the girlfriends did actually was share their own testimo this testimonials or their own written accounts of their experiences. And so now they're moving from um, being uh, advocates within their schools to actually advocating on behalf of all girls and boys in the state. So moving into policy as well. And so here's a, another example. Every year in Chicago, in downtown Chicago, there's a standing silence uh, for an hour uh, in the Daily Center. And so here's an example of the girlfriends being part of the movement within Chicago to end violence and, and sexual violence. And this was taken two years ago. And now they're actually standing silent in North Lawndale. So they're taking a model that's used in the city of Chicago and actually localizing it into their own community. And so they're standing silent for an hour in North Londo. Uh, we, are, we believe that gender violence is intersectional, and so we don't silo domestic violence and dating violence and sexual harassment and sexual assault. And so, again, they're all year program, and so this is what they, they, they spend each month coming up with different campaigns to address the broader issue of violence against girls and women. They also now are, um, as I said, becoming experts, and so they're presenting at national conferences. Uh, this summer, last summer they presented at the National Sexual Assault Conference, and they also presented at the Facing Race Conference in Detroit. So they're actually leading the presentations and training adults to think about these issues. Uh, this year there was the One Billion Rising event that was all over the world that was sponsored by V-Day, and so our girls um, were part of that and also presented their poetry. And then last week, uh, Eve Ensler was in Chicago, and the girls danced on stage with her for a, a national funders event. So this is kind of the transformation that we're talking about, that over uh, the last four years, we've seen 
a small group of girls, and now it's, it's a larger group, and they're also just moving up to the kind of chain of women's rights activism pretty quickly. And this is uh, in North Lawndale in particular, this, this one campus. Uh, they're meeting with the principal of their school, and they're talking about these issues. Uh, and they came up with a set of policy recommendations for their school itself. And so you can just look at them, make girlfriends a mandatory class, have more lighting in the park around the campus, more security guards, have policies and procedures in the school handbook, and develop more advocates at their school who are trained specifically in the issue of gender-based violence. And more counseling, obviously, for people who are trained in this issue. So I just want to end there. That's my story of coming to this movement and growing up in this movement at this point, and also transferring my energy and the baton of activism to a younger generation who I really believe is the future. Um, and so I just want to open it up for question or conversation. Uh, but this is why we call it a long walk home. Um, and it's a journey that's continuing and a movement we would like you all to be part of. Thank you. We do have time for some questions, so if you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Hi, my name is Mara D'Amico, and I'm a first year student at the Clinton School of Public Service. And thank you so much for sharing your story with thank us. Thank you. Um, I, we spoke a little bit about this at lunch, but I was hoping that you could um, share with the audience more effective ways that we can include men in issues that are typically thought of as women's issues, such as domestic violence and sexual assault and rape? Yeah, it's a great question, and thanks for asking it again <laughs> in a, a larger audience. Um, so I said at lunch, and I'll say it again, it's a real passion of mine. Um, I'm kind of a zealot around, about involving men um, in the movement, really recruiting, involving, and creating really deep collaborations and alliances with men. So structurally in our organization, our board is 60% women, 40% men. Um, and I said that I, you know, I have a particular concern to have men who are, are not seen as leaders in this movement, African-American men be pivotal to, to, to the social change. And so I've had the good fortune of having another number of men who have been allies um, and board members and workers in our organization. But um, the other thing I think is, there's a couple of ways I think we have to approach the issue. One, um, you know, in Chicago, gang violence is a really big topic. And so oftentimes the programming there is, is focused on boys who are disproportionately members of, of gangs. Um, but there's a lack of emphasis on gender violence, a, the way, ways in which girls are recruited to be members of gangs, as well as way in which a kind of hyper-masculinity is used um, to, to maintain boys being in gangs. So we are collaborating with organizations in Chicago to intersect gender violence and gang violence more explicitly, right? So that they come do trainings for us, we come do trainings for them. So that's another way, I think, of, of getting boys to kind of understand that this issue is important. Um, and the other thing I think is that there are so, one in six boys will be uh, victims of sexual assault in their lifetime. So it's simply not a, an issue that's only related to girls and women on a mathematical level, right? We have a fair number, we're seeing increasing number of men come forward and say that they've experienced this in their childhood. And we have a number of high profile cases that, that show us this. So it's also um, figuring out a model to get men who are survivors of sexual assault to also be leaders in this movement as well. And so I said, uh, we have to figure out a way to uh, um, centralize men in the movement without making them the center of the movement, right? Um, because that's also the, the ongoing issue. And there are a number of organizations, Men Can Stop Rape and Call uh, to Action, Call two organizations that are based, one in Baltimore and one in New York City, that do national programs to engage men on both an ally level and an advocacy level to end violence against girls and women. So there are models out there. It's just that they may not be getting the same kind of visibility to the other groups. Something like V-Day, for example, does get. So I think there are models out there, but also we have to be kind of creative and innovative in figuring out how to get boys to really take this on, and men to take this on as an issue that is theirs, because they either grow up in issues with domestic violence or sexual assault, or they'll know someone eventually, or they may be a victim themselves. So it is their issue. We just have to figure out ways of framing it as such. Chair. Thank you, Salamisha, for coming to speak to us today. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jacob Perry. I'm a classmate of, of some of the students here. And Mara kind of led into my question, because 
I wanted to know specifically, I look around the room, I see in the pictures and the videos that you, you showed on your, mm -hmm. in your presentation that there's a severe shortage of men, yeah. um, which in one way is shameful that more men aren't engaged, but um, it also speaks to the challenge of men getting engaged. It's a very sensitive subject. So I'm wondering how can we uh, proactively get engaged without having to be drawn in, because sometimes that doesn't happen, and, and, and how can we do that effectively and, and appropriately? So how to be proactively engaged without being recruited? Well, yes. <laughs> yes, because otherwise we're just, we might never get that invitation and we don't know how to engage. How can we do that? Okay, so there's a number, I mean, I don't know if I can answer that as, well, I'll answer it this way. So on college campuses around the country, there's an organization called War, One in Four, um, which is speaking to one in four women who will be victims of sexual assault, but it's a men's group, right? So they have them popping up all over the country. Um, there's one on my campus as well at the University of Pennsylvania. So I think they're having men not just be that taking this issue on as their own, but also being the kind of face of recruitment, being the face of engagement, and recruiting other boys and other men to be part of it, I think is, is a really useful way. I mean, I think in that model, men are doing the work and they're figuring out really innovative ways to get other men involved, right? So the onus is not on women to actually recruit men, but the onus is on other men who are socially aware and socially conscious and empathetic or sympathetic to the cause to do that work. Um, the other thing I think is that because rape and domestic violence are seen as women's issues, somehow it's not considered urgent enough to be considered part of our broader, broader social justice movement. And I think that's a problem. I think that's changing, but it's still kind of siloed or segregated as something that only affects women, so therefore it's not as important as these other dominant issues. And so for us, I think we always are thinking about the intersections, the intersections of gender violence and poverty. If poverty is your issue, it does impact gender violence. If racism is the issue that you're interested in, how do you look at it through a lens of ending rape? I mean, all of these core issues that I think most of us are concerned with, um, we tend to rank higher than issues that affect girls and women specifically. And so it's figuring out how those issues intersect with this, and then also prioritizing this as something that's not just happening to those people over there, but it's something happening to all of us. And we all know someone, or most many of us in this room are victims of these crimes. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Annie. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tello. I want to focus a little beyond where you spoke today and get your expertise. Basically, what you talked about was what I call PIT, prevention intervention, which was the treatment, and where do you go for help to reverse this uh, escalating social issue? How do you address, through the arts, that much of the hip-hop music, um, much of how the people who are the most distinguished stylish designers of women's clothes in the courts, they say you encouraged a rape by the dress that you wear, and I'm not the dress, how you dress. Mm -hmm. How do you assess whether that research is leaning in the right direction, or whether we'll have prevention and intervention for the healing mm -hmm. aspect? No, that's a really good question. So my talk last night, for those who were there, no, I was talking about like hip hop, and I was talking about dress, those two really, because I was talking about pop culture and the ways in which pop culture um, both per perpetuates a rape culture and also the ways in which people are using pop culture to address and uh, dismantle that power as well. So on, on one hand, um, I did talk about hip hop and I talked about this recent song uh, verse by Rick Ross, who some of you may know, some of a lot of you probably don't know, and it was uh, promoting rape and, and it was about a, a woman who was um, under the influence of, of ecstasy and that he raped her and she didn't know. So that's the song. And then that was, and there was a huge outcry um, in response to that. So that's also new. Like, so we've had these kind of really damaging lyrics for a very long time. And it's not just hip hop, it's in rock and it's in Hollywood, it's, all, it's the culture at large. Um, but what we're seeing now are young people using social media to organize and reject some of that um, misogyny. And so recently I found out, actually last night, that Rick Ross was dropped by Reebok. So there was a petition to get him dropped by Reebok. That was effective. And there's also uh, the artist who used him took the verse out of the song. And hip hop artists themselves were responding publicly to the misogyny. So we're seeing an increasing awareness around issues of 
violence against girls and women, and people are taking to Twitter as well as to the streets to really address those issues. In terms of dress itself, um, there was a movement called the, it was kind of controversial, the slut walk movement uh, that did not really take off as, as, as fervently or as widespread as we would have liked, but there was a movement uh, two years ago to address this issue. Uh, um, there was a police officer in Toronto who's training students about sexual violence. He says, well, if women just stop dressing like sluts, then we would end rape. And so there was a, a response, and they said, well, you know what? We're just going to call ourselves sluts, and we're going to actually have a series of marches all over the world to protest this. And I attended the one in DC. And what was interesting is that I actually saw survivors for the first time in my life I've ever seen this wearing the outfits that they wore when they were sexually assaulted. And you would see the wide range. You would see people in pajamas that were really baggy. You would see someone dressed in tight pants and, and a really you know, low cut shirt. It was all of these different um, outfits, right? And so it really, I think, challenged this very damaging but useful stereotype, I think, for rapists that women dress a certain way and that therefore it leads to the violence against them. And I think that's all part of the victim blaming culture as opposed to the prevention awareness that you're talking about that we desperately need. I was on the National Board of the YWCA for 12 years uh -huh. and I was in and on the streets when homelessness was just getting there. And I've always been just like I am here, aggressive and seeking answers. <laughs> And so when I saw so many people, particularly over at the um, World Trade Center where I was staying, and I asked this homeless lady, I said, how do you go to sleep on top of this bent yeah. and not be afraid of being raped? And she said, poor innocent you. Honey, a rapist would not want to pull off all these clothes I got. This is my wardrobe. And I thought about how protective they protect themselves with their clothing. Yeah, but I imagine that homeless women are even more vulnerable than most women um, in the United States. So even though that moment may have been true, when we know levels of homelessness, poverty, um, people who have less resources are more vulnerable to these crimes and are less likely to use the resources like a rape crisis center to help in their recovery process or seek redress in the judicial system. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for your presentation. No, thank you. Um, my question is more so, um, like, how do you long walk home? Like, I remember you said at the beginning of your story, you were trying to figure out, like, you know, where could I go? You were reaching out for help, and you couldn't reach out for help. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a situation, you know, that I know of personally where someone was affected by sexual, was abused sexually as a child, yeah. and, you know, she had to go away from, for some time, and, you know, she never really reached out for any help or any services, and she came home, and her daughter told her a story about someone, you know, touching her yeah. in, in such a way. And, you know, she continues to remain in this relationship with this person. But, you know, I, I, the work that A Long Walk Home is doing, uh, it's aggressive, it's progressive for the young girls so that we can end a, end a cycle. You know, what about those women who have been touched, you know, in that way yeah. uh, by some, you know, in some form of sexual assault or abuse? Like, you know, where do they go from here, mm -hmm. well, you know? Yeah, so I'll just quickly say, um, when I started going to therapy in the late 90s, um, I was part of group, I went to group and individual therapy at this rape crisis center. And one of the th experiences that stay with, stayed with me the longest, I guess, was uh, it was a small group I was part of, it was intergenerational, but there was a woman there who was 65 years old, and she was sexually assaulted when she was a child. And she'd gone her whole life without getting therapy. And then she decided she needed to get help. And so seeing that, that there's never, it's never too late to start the recovery process or the healing process, I think is really important to know. The other thing I would say is I am a child of a woman who was sexually assaulted. It sh shaped our lives in really important ways. We, my mom was sexually assaulted by a stranger in Boston, and then we were sent to Trinidad to live with my father. Um, and, but her silence around sexual assault, uh, we never talked about it. We didn't really know what happened. She had a very different recovery process for me. But I do think it's really important for parents to take this issue on, if they've been victims of violence or their child is a victim of violence, um, to take it on as something 
that they can engage in, that they get therapy or help for, um, and that they understand by not dealing with it as a parent who's a, a victim of sexual assault, there are ways in which um, your child may be more vulnerable to experiencing it as well. So I think, not, to, not blaming the victim or blaming the parent, but to understand the relationship between intergenerational forms of violence. And so I guess I don't, I don't think it's too late for that parent to get it. But with mothers, I've noticed that maybe they won't get help for themselves, but they will get help for themselves if they think it may make their child's life better. This scenario seems a little bit more extreme since the person, but, but it's also really illegal. I mean, it's un, if the child's being sexually assaulted by her partner, let's say, that's, a, I mean, that, the police should be called. And I mean, that's, it's, a crime is happening, and if you know it's happening, I guess we all have the responsibility to make sure that that's not happening anymore. So. Sure, not a problem. <laughs> Can I, I want to pass, can you just sign, I have a sign-in sheet for people just so we can let you know what's going on. I'm listening. I'm multitasking. Also, <laughs> um, I just moved here from Dallas and I'm working for the Center of Healing Hearts and Spirits and so as a sexual assault volunteer coordinator, and this is mm. extremely new, professionally speaking, mm. and I'm just being open and honest, mm. like since starting, you know, work this week, I have been having like the worst nightmares not yeah. that i don't want to you know be in the field that i am yeah. i'm in yeah but like how do you how do you deal with that you know like yeah. i'm sure that you have heard some horrendous stories yeah and i honestly have not been able to sleep yeah. this week like at all yeah i had i'm truthfully i yeah. have no well i think it's good to know that your response is normal and also a sign of compassion but this stuff is so overwhelming. you shouldn't in a way be able to sleep completely when you hear these. So I'm not trying to say I want you to get a good night's sleep, but um, you know, I've been thinking about this because like every other day I've been getting a disclosure. Um, I've been getting disclosures from students, from friends, from friends I didn't know. You know, it's been a little overwhelming. Um, and so for me, I think doing activism uh, really does help. Like when you, for me, so for, for doing this work and under, like fighting hard to end sexual violence and dating violence and domestic violence actually helps me understand those stories differently. And also, I feel like it's really important for me to share my story publicly so that someone else who doesn't have the strength or the resources to do so knows that someone has gone through an experience similar to them um, and that there's, there is a process of recovery and finding one's voice in the midst of violence that is true and that I've lived. So I think those are my ways of, of doing it. And I also go to therapy uh, still. I'm a firm believer in therapy, so I would just say, uh, if you are in this field and you are taking on these stories and you're taking them in your body and your mind, that you should probably also seek help because you're a secondary, potentially a secondary victim of a crime against another person. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, yeah, one more. I'm not trying to do your job. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I'm a teacher, so yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, thank you for your defense of Planned Parenthood, talking about the ripple effect. Um, thank you. I, looked, I was interested in the statistics of how few rapes are reported, and then in addition to that, how many, even if they are reported, are not even prosecuted. And it made me wonder how many young, or how many perpetrators of rape are aware yeah. that they are considered, did you ever confront your rapist, and or does he have any idea yeah. that he is a rapist, because there must be a whole lot of young men, particularly, that are not even aware that what they did was considered rape. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I, have, I never, uh, one person was in Kenya, so I never saw that person again. The other person, I didn't confront. The last time I saw him, I was it's in really beginning the process of healing and felt really vulnerable. But I imagine on some level I may see that person again, and now I have, you know, ammunition, like an arsenal of myself to feel comfortable saying what happened to me. But I think what you're pointing to is something that we don't really talk about um, as much. And the fact that oftentimes, you know, I heard a story from a good friend the other day who was sexually assaulted, and, and she's a 35-year-old woman, uh, and it, she was sexually assaulted uh, under conditions very similar to the girl in Steubenville. She was intoxicated, and the person was supposed to drive her home because he was driving a whole bunch of people home. She woke up. Uh, and in his apartment, and he was, you know, assaulting her. 
And for me, his response was so quick. He was like, okay, you know, he, he was a serial rapist. Like he'd done this so many times that he'd almost perfected the art of sexual, not the art, the, the, the sorry, the perfected the crime of sexual violence. And so I think we need to talk about how oftentimes people who do commit acts of sexual aggression and sexual assault have done it repeatedly and that they know they can get away with it. So that's one thing. And then the other thing I think is there is a really deliberate movement to talk more explicitly about consent. So a lot of times men may say they didn't know they raped a woman because they weren't sure. I don't tend to buy that as much, but I do know it's a defense that people use. So I think uh, really ongoing and rigorous uh, conversations about what consent is, uh, specifically in high schools, middle schools, and college campuses, I think, need to be um, mandated, actually. So as part of sex, sexual health curriculums, as well as you know, residential treatment, residential center. I mean, there's so many ways that this conversation needs to happen. And there's an organization in Chicago called Sex Signals that does national programming, uh, and they use comedy to do it, and, and theater to talk about consent in really important ways. I think it was either last year or two years ago, the speaker that we had that talked kind of about that. They did a bunch of research on the, the perpetrator in these assaults last year. And they, they know. Um, they may not admit it in public, but when they know that they're anonymous, they are much higher incidences of admitting sexual assault from the male point of view. And so even if they're not saying it in, to you or to their friends, they at least know what they did was wrong. So there is a, a much higher rate when they know that they can't get in trouble yeah. um, to admitting it. Exactly, and oftentimes they're planned as well. Right. The majority are planned. So yeah, the ones that do admit, it's not like once a, you know, every blue moon. It's like once a week, once a month. Yeah. Well, thank you, Helen, again. Thank all of you for coming out. Dr. Litt, thank you, and uh, thank we'll you. see you all at the next one.